Welcome everyone uh, to this seminar from presented by the Nordic Bioplastic Organization. And I would say in, in very close cooperation with, with uh, the European Bioplastics Organization. Uh, we have a very interesting program today with two speakers. Uh, we're going to learn a little bit about, uh, uh, or a lot, I hope, about uh, how EU is looking at uh, bioplastics right now. And we're also going to get a picture of what's going on in different countries in, in, um, in EU when it comes to bioplastics. We have two speakers, Maria Negut from, from um, European Bioplastics and Dirk from, from, from um, the Belgian Bioplastics Association. And he has promised to take the, the role in presenting what's going on in, in, in Europe. Uh, my name is Bu Valtig. I'm the, actually the editor of the magazine Nord Emballage, the biggest packaging magazine in the Scandinavian ar uh, area. And, uh, but I'm also one of the founders of the Nordic Bioplastics Organization uh, in 2012. So it's 10 years this year, actually. And uh, I mean, it's not strange. We all know that almost 50% of all bioplastics is used in the packaging industry. So there is a close connection. Uh, you are very welcome to become a member of the organization, of course. We have today like uh, 65 to 70 member companies, and we are quite active with webinars like this and also with, with uh, a lot of activities on, on local shows and also lobbying against the politicians. So um, today we are going to see what EU thinks about uh, bioplastics and, uh, uh, you know, plastics in general is in a bad situation right now, I would say. Uh, there's a lot of discussions that plastic is a real threat to the society and uh, actually I don't share that uh, that thought but that's another thing and the, the next question to put is of course is bioplastic the solution for, for the plastic problems and the answer is of course uh, you can say right out that yes it is because bioplastics also has its problems but still bioplastic is a better choice like it says says in the in the sign behind me it is absolutely a better choice and a step in the right way. And we hope that bioplastic will be even more used in the future, of course. Uh, just before we start, I want to say that we record this uh, session and it will be available in about a week or two on our website. And you will also be able to download the presentations there, just so that you know. And as, if you have any questions, you can put them in a the Q&A file and we see, let's see if we can put some questions to the speakers. Um, uh, after each presentation. So I think we start here and we are going, ladies first, Maria Negut, are going to start and tell us uh, a little bit about the situation in Brussels and EU right now and how they look at, at bioplastics for the moment. So Maria, I think you are quite new at the European Bioplastics Organization, if I remember it right, but uh, you, maybe you can present yourself very quickly before you start your presentation. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bo, and thank you to everyone attending the webinar. It's great to see uh, such a high number of people interested in uh, bioplastics and uh, the policy environment. Uh, so indeed, I joined the UBP early March, so I'm, I'm rather new at European bioplastics, but I have been working in EU affairs and, and, and public affairs for quite some time. I have a background in political sciences and European affairs, and I have worked um, also in the European institutions and for other trade associations, always based in Brussels. So I'm really happy to be joining the team. Uh, we're split between Berlin and Brussels, um, but we are a very dynamic team and uh, I'm very happy to be here today to, to represent uh, the association. Um, so I will start with, with my presentation. Um, just let me know if you can, I hope you can see my slides. Um, and I will present you the EU policy update and the political environment relevant for, for bioplastics. Um, so I will, I will split my presentation in two. First, a bit about European bioplastics, who we are and what we do, as well as our members, and then the policy environment. Um, so about us, uh, we have uh, 25 plus years of uh, experience in bioplastics. Uh, we were funded in 1993. In, in Berlin, uh, so we were very focused on Germany and then we moved in 2005, we had 50 members and right now we have 70 members and we are uh, advocating at EU and member state level for um, a policy framework in which the European bioplastics can thrive in. Um, and we are constantly in engagement and in dialogue with all the relevant stakeholders. 
um, I will move to the next slide. So this is a, a glimpse of, uh, of some of our members. Uh, so you'll rep see that we are representing the entire um, value chain. Uh, we have the renewable raw materials, the certification bodies, uh, the bioplastics manufacturers and auxiliaries, as well as converters, uh, brand owners and research. Uh, we're also organizing an annual conference, the European Bioplastics Conference um, in Berlin. So you can save the date already. It will be in December on the 6th and on the 7th um, at the Maritime Pro Arte Hotel in Berlin. And you can find more information in the link uh, that you see here below and on our website. So I will start with the, with the EU policy overview. And I added here a slide uh, so you can see a bit everything that is happening in terms of, of green deal, uh, sustainability, green claims, um, circular economy and environmental protection at EU level. So with the, with the green deal uh, that was announced in 2019, indeed there's a lot of legislation and a lot of policy development um, taking place in Brussels. So for an association, but also for companies to, um, to, to keep up with what is happening, it's, it's quite challenging. Of course, all these challenges also bring opportunities. Um, so you will see all these are very relevant for the bioplastic sector, but I will focus in my presentation today on the EU taxonomy regulation, on the Sustainable Products Initiative, SPI, um, on the PPWD revision, which for us is really a key uh, policy development, as well as the upcoming policy framework for bio-based, biodegradable and compostable plastics. And last but not least, uh, the recently opened revision uh, by the European Commission of the Waste Framework Directive. So I will start with the EU taxonomy regulation. I don't know how much you're aware of that, but that's a very important piece of legislation that entered into force on the 12th of July 2020 across all EU 27 member states. It's a regulation, so it's legally binding and it's applied the same throughout the European Union. What is it exactly the taxonomy? It's a classification system. It enables um, to have categories of economic activities or sectors that play a key role in climate change mitigation and adaptation. Basically, it creates a list of activities that are considered safe or green for investors. An investor takes the list of the taxonomy, it looks at the technical criteria and says, okay, that's worth investing my money in because it's considered to be green. And how do they assess this? They have um, six environmental objectives. Uh, one, it's climate change mitigation climate change adaptation, sustainable use and protection of water and marine resources. It has to prove a transition to a circular economy, pollution prevention and control, or protection and restoration of biodiversity and ecosystems. Why I added the taxonomy regulation here? It's because bioplastics are actually listed as green investments. We are considered under the EU taxonomy regulation to be contributing substantially to climate change mitigation. And that's a very good thing for us because indeed we do need more investment and in research and development to be able to, um, to, to create demand as well on the market. So the taxonomy, it has, um, the taxonomy regulation is in place since July, but it will also publish additional climate delegated acts with technical screening criteria for other products. So it's something that must be monitored. Um, I will move now next to the, and I will take questions later. I will move now to the policy framework on bio-based, biodegradable and compostable plastics. That's a very important again piece of, of legislation because until now there was no legal framework for bioplastics. Um, so we really welcome this uh, this intention and this uh, action from the European Commission side. We're expecting the proposal, uh, the communication to be published in July 2020. The exact date is the 20th of July that we, we expect to see it uh, published. The focus will be on the sourcing, so sustainable sourcing of bioplastics and how do you define what is sustainable, the labeling and the use of bioplastics. The issues to be tackled in the communication will be as follow. 
communication with consumers, because what we heard from the European Commission is that there seems to be an issue with the way we communicate to the consumers or the way in generally it is communicated about bioplastics, issues around greenwashing and also the distinction, the clear distinction between what is biodegradable, what is compostable and what is bio-based plastics. So they want to tackle this issue of communication with consumers. Second, they will focus on the bio-based feedstock and then on the role of biodegradable and compostable plastics in the circular economy. And here they will look at reuse and recycling targets. Our position is that we really welcome this proposal, but we want it to be done in a right way. In a right way, we mean to create a level playing field for all the operators on the internal EU market, while at the same time to have a full recognition of bioplastics contribution to a sustainable plastics economy, to the circular bioeconomy, and also to our role in defossilizing the European economy. So we want the EU to really have a, a clear focus on that. As I mentioned, there was no legal basis before. So if this policy is done right, it can actually be um, a major opportunity for us as well. The third point on my list in terms of policy making is the revision of the packaging and packaging waste directive, the so-called uh, PPWD. That's a very important piece of legislation because it's reviewing the previous packaging and packaging waste directive. Um, there are some opportunities, but also a lot of concerns with regards to bioplastics. Um, I will start with, um, with, with the main purpose of the revision. All packaging placed on the EU market will have to be mandatory, reusable or recyclable in an economically viable way by 2030. Another change that comes with the revision is before it was a directive, so member states Member states had, in a way, the freedom to implement also according to their national objectives and priorities. Of course, they had to follow the line of the Commission, but they had some, some, room, some flexibility in terms of how would they implement the legislation at national level. This time, however, the Commission is proposing to move away from a directive towards a regulation, which again will be legally binding and a regulation will make all EU member states at a certain date, as the fixed date, the regulation will have to enter into force and it will be the same applied to all EU27. So there will be no room for, for flexibility left in this sense. They would also like to review uh, the essential requirements of packaging. They would like to provide a definition of recyclability. Then the priority of the European Commission is reuse and recycled content. And here we expressed our concerns to the Commission that focusing too much on reuse and recycle content would actually not help us in moving away from the dependency we have on fossil fuels and conventional plastics. So of course we support recycling, we support reuse, but we think that bio-based content should be put on an equal footing as recycled content. Um, and of course, we, we asked that biobase would be included in, in, the, in the preferred policy option. We also have to, to look at the biodegradable plastics and compostable plastics and make sure that they're also included there and, and have uh, an important role to play in the PPWD revision. The Commission is also looking to harmonize the labeling um, that will be on, on, uh, placed on packaging. And uh, we expect the proposal to be published in autumn 2022. It was expected actually to be published in July, on the 20th of July, the same day as the policy framework for a bio-based, biodegradable and compostable plastics. However, um, the Commission, DG Environment, who is leading the file, submitted the impact assessment to the regulatory scrutiny board and they received a negative opinion. This means that they had to take back the impact assessment and do some, some changes in the impact assessment, and they will resubmit uh, the document to the regulatory scrutiny board on the 2nd of July. So the time that the regulatory scrutiny board will have to, to analyze the proposal, they will come back probably in, in autumn, we will have uh, a clear proposal. We do have some, um, as I mentioned, some concerns with regards to the PPWD. One of those concerns is linked to the negative list that is being proposed by the Commission. Um, negative list means um, uh, the packaging uh, that cannot be recycled uh, in an economically viable way. It will be out of the market by 2030. Second is 
um, re with regards to innovative products, and we know that bioplastics are innovative products. So one proposal for the revision of the PPWD from the Commission side is that all innovative products placed on the market should have a um, properly functioning recycling stream within five years since they were placed on the market. And for us, five years, it's really not feasible because we know that we have some products, um, bioplastics placed on the market that even in 10 years, they don't have a proper working recycling stream due to different factors. Is the market demand? But also it's, of course, to have market demand, you have to have a proper and you have to have a policy that would incentivize the use and uptake of bioplastics. So we asked the commission to extend the five years to at least 10 years, because otherwise we fear that there will be no incentives for innovation and for research and development. <clears throat> Sorry for my voice. Um, for bioplastics. Um, so these are just some of our, of our issues. <clears throat> I apologize, I have a quite bad cold, so it, it was okay until now, but um, so these are some of the issues that we, we see with the commission. And also one thing is that bio-based plastics were not included in the first impact assessment drafted by the commission. And that for us, it's key. We really asked and we are advocating to be considered because we should be on the same level as recycled content because we do contribute to a circular economy and we do contribute to, um, to being sure that we keep with reducing the impact of fossil fuels. Um, so our position is that of course, bioplastic packaging, which is a very important market for us, packaging helps in closing the material and carbon cycle. And we increase also the use of bio waste. So we avoid that the bio waste ends up in the in incineration or landfill where it should not be. So this is indeed, as I mentioned, a very important piece of legislation. We're, we're uh, closely monitoring this and we will publish a position paper next week, around mid next week. Um, so we will be happy to share that with you. If you're interested, please reach out to me and I will share with you the position paper on the PPWD. I will move next to the Waste Framework Directive revision. Um, this is, again, a separate piece of legislation, equally important, that will also complement the wider PPWD. We know that the public consultation was launched by the Commission on the 24th of May, um, so that was um, last week, and the deadline to provide feedback is the 16th of August. Uh, the priorities of the revision is to reduce the waste generation, including reuse of products and components, also to reduce the mixed waste and to increase the preparation for reuse and recycling of waste by improving separate collection. It will also integrate the food waste initiative. The proposal for a directive will also establish a waste hierarchy so that we have to be very careful as well where are we included in the list of, in the waste hierarchy, where our products are being included. Um, we do have an EUB position on that, and we will of course submit our input to the commission through the public consultation. And we also um, invite you to do the same because it would be very important to have as, as, as a high number of poss as possible as of stakeholders. So the European bioplastics position is that we would like to promote the use of bio-based recyclable and or biodegradable and compostable plastics, as they can play a significant role in reducing the impact on the environment and on the climate while maximizing the benefits of the plastic sector at the same time. Um, so we know that the, the European Parliament will also have a very important role to play in the revision of the Waste Framework Directive, as well as, the, um, as uh, on the PPWD. As I mentioned, the two pieces of legislation there will be interlinked and in this sense, we know that, for example, for the PPWD, the Parliament announced who will be the rapporteur. The rapporteur will be Simona Bonafé for the Environmental Committee, and Maria Spiraki will be for the ITRE Committee, representing the industry. We also know that they will work very closely with the upcoming presidency of the Council of the European Union, with the Czech presidency. Um, so we also have to see how to align with the priorities at national level of the Czech presidency and the priorities and what they will they will uh, advocate for at EU level during the, the six months of presidency. I will move next to the SPI, the Sustainable Products Initiative and the Commission proposal for 
eco-design regulation, the so-called ESPR. So again, all these policy initiatives, they're interlinked. Um, and here you will see that the purpose is to have um, an environmental policy that will look at sustainability of the product throughout the entire product life cycle. And here I speak about the LCA method, life cycle assessment, and the PEF method, product environmental footprint method. And you may know that we as EUBP, we have issued a position paper on the, on the proposed methodology the LCA methodology for um, alternative feedstock used for plastics production, meaning bioplastics. And we consider that the current method to evaluate the product environmental footprint for bioplastic is not fit for purpose. So we have a strong concern that the Commission will use this PEF method in the SPI legislation and in the ESPR uh, legislation. What does that mean? Um, it means that each product will have to have a digital product passport in which uh, product manufacturers will be obliged to publish the material composition of the product as well as the chemical properties. So here there are concerns with the intellectual property rights, because if you have to make it available, the entire chemical proposition and the entire uh, material composition of the product, then of course you have issues linked to competition and to, to IP. So we want to see how the Commission will tackle these concerns. As I mentioned, they, they intend to use the PEF method to evaluate sustainability of products placed on the EU market. And in this regard, to, to be able to make green claims and to add a label on each product that will be an eco-design label. Um, there is, again, a call open for feedback on the Commission website, uh, feedback on the EC proposal, and the call is open until 22nd of June. And again, I, I encourage you to, to provide feedback, notably, notably on the digital product passport, which I think will be a matter of concern for, for everyone, and not only for bioplastics, but for many other industries. Um, and at the same time uh, on the use of the LCA and PEF method, because we have to see what kind of impact will, be, will that have on bioplastics. Um, if they will use the PEF method and you compare conventional plastics with bioplastics using the PEF method proposed by the Commission, there the, we will have no advantage over conventional plastics according to the method. And that, of course, we think it's, it's, it doesn't make any sense because if you're speaking about Green Deal, then you should also walk the talk um, with regards to, to compostable, biodegradable, and also bio-based plastics. So that was, that was it from my side in terms of, of the policy developments. Um, as I mentioned, a lot is happening at EU level. Um, we, are, we are very active in Brussels and we are, of course, also open to, to discuss with other organizations such as the Nordics Bioplastics and everyone that is in, interested to, to learn more and to, to discuss with us on what happens in, in Brussels in terms of policy development um, or if you have any position papers that you think you would like to share with us. Um, I'm, I'm open to, to receive them. You have my, my email address here on the last slide, and I will be also sharing the slides um, with the organizers of the webinar, so you can have them um, after the discussion. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Maria. Perfect. Very interesting information and quite on, on time. I'm impressed. <laughs> Um, we have some questions coming in here, actually. Before we take them, just a quick question for me. Could you say anything about the, the general view of uh, how the EU looks at uh, bioplastics? Do you, would you say they have a positive view on bioplastics or a negative view? Um, I would not be as black and white as you put it. Uh, no. I would not say it's either positive or negative. I would say that there is a need for more information. Um, so we need to, um, it, it's a sort of, um, how to call it, a sort of education as well that goes both ways. So from the commission to us and from us to, to policymakers, um, because of course it's um, sometimes even for people working in the industry, uh, there might be some things that are, are, are sometimes unclear. Um, so I think they, they don't have a clear opinion yet also within the different DGs um, in the Commission, because it's not only DG Environment working on that. You have DG Environment, but you have DG Grow as well, representing the industry. You also have DG RTD, representing research and innovation, and you also have DG Agri, 
DG Agriculture who is involved. So there are different DGs uh, working on, on bioplastics and the opinion sometimes might be different uh, from one DG to the other. Um, so I would say that they have a good understanding by now, but there is room for improvement. Um, and that's, that's also our job um, uh, to be sure that, uh, that we communicate properly. And that's also the purpose for the different position papers we're issuing. Um, and yes, I think we, for now, to be honest, we're a bit in, in waiting mode. Uh, we're waiting for the policy framework for the 20th of July. Um, it's uh, one month and a half to go. Um, and that will be really key. And then for the packaging and packaging waste directive, I think that's a bit more sensitive and more complicated. Um, and here, there, I feel that the understanding is, is, is not the same across the different DGs. So um, there is a very strong focus on recycled content. And as the commission put it in, a, in, a, in actually a public webinar in which they presented their views, they said um, recycled content is superior in their view as opposed to bioplastics. Um, so there, as I mentioned, of course, we do promote recycling. Uh, we, we think it's very, very important to recycle, but I think recycling will not be enough to reach the targets of carbon neutrality by 2050. So, because if you're only focusing on recycling and reuse, you also have to look at the issues around quality of the recycled content. You will have a competition of the market as well among different competitors in accessing the quality uh, products. Mm -hmm. And of course, you're still relying on fossil-based fuels. So I think we, I think we both have place on the market, recycled content and bio-based, biodegradable and compostable plastics. We have, there is room for everyone. Um, but I think if really now it's the moment with also with everything happening in Ukraine, and we, we see that relying um, so much on fossil fuels, sometimes it's, sometimes very often it's, it's not a good thing. So we have to look at what nature has to offer us. Um, and not only nature, we have to look at the entire spectrum of bioplastics. And I think we, we need to have some incentives in this sense. And that's what we are communicating to the commission. You have financial incentives for recycled content. We would like to have the same financial incentives for bioplastics. So if you're working towards a level playing field, then at least offer the same opportunities to, to all the actors. Okay, thank you. Shall we put, pick some of the questions that come up in the chat here? I have one here. Is uh, EN 13432 regulation, which talks about labeling package as biodegradable slash compostable legitimate? It is legitimate. And we, we, we transmitted that to the commission in our position paper as well. Uh, the position that we will we will issue next week, as I mentioned. Okay. What is your expectation on these these new policy objectives initiating an amendment to the definition of plastics in the SUPD, which currently includes bioplastics? So I'm reading the question as well. What is your expectation on these new policy objectives initiating an amendment to the definition? So first of all, the e, uh, SUPD was a directive, and we also know that Italy, for example, took a different path with regards to, um, uh, to bioplastics as opposed to the other countries, because in the S SUPD, bioplastics are considered as are on the same level as conventional plastics. So there is no difference among the two. They, they were considered to be out of the market, and it was different in Italy. So I think with the, with the new policy objectives, we, we, we have to see, um, I'm, I'm trying to, to really understand the question better. Um, so expectation in terms of policy, of, of course, I would expect them to consider bioplastics as the preferred option. So I, I'm waiting for the impact assessment to see if we are there because in the first impact assessment, we were not included. Um, so luckily, they received a negative opinion from the scrutiny board, and I'm, you know, I say luckily because there was, there was maybe some some room for us also to to develop further on our advocacy. Uh, my expectation is that we would be included in the preferred option, and we would be given the same rank as recycled content. Okay. Here's another tricky question. Can you please give some more details about how we, it will be measured that the material is made of bio-based feedstock? And if C if C fourteen is still the measure, how will how will be how will the materials treated and 
that are not made out of C. So I suppose so. So uh, I'm I'm opening the question, so it's easier yeah. for me to to see it myself yeah. uh, about how it will be measured that the material is made of bio-based feedstock and. So we, we ask the commission to consider the C14 method. Yes. Okay. That's the simple answer. That's, that's, that's what we ask in our position paper. Uh, okay. But again, we don't know if they will take that into account or not, but that's what we asked for. Okay. The last one. Is the composition on the digital product passport the same as disclosed in the MSDS? Sometimes it stays vogue. The composition of the digital product is the same as disclosing in some sense. Yes, good point. You know, how much do you have to disclose in the digital product passport? Um, right now, the way the proposal stands is that each product will have to have a QR code easily scan to be easily scanned by, by everyone. And with that digital code, you will have access to the entire material and chemical composition. So I would understand by entire, everything is there. But again, to be very honest, I don't think this will pass. Just because if you think about, I mean, everything, all the products that we have on the, on the EU market, if we have to disclose the material of everything, then where would that go for innovation? Would the company be incentivized to have a new product? if they will have to, to publish everything about the composition. What about competition? So again, with legislation, what we need to understand, and that's, that's really key, it's the commission comes with a proposal. It doesn't mean that the proposal will be implemented as such. The proposal will then go to the two other co-legislators, to the Council of the EU, represented by all the EU 27 member states, and that has the, the presidency of the council, leading and to the European Parliament and they have the right to make amendments so the proposal can be changed drastically from how it looks in the beginning to how it looks towards the end. So to be honest with the digital product passport I think it will suffer quite some changes and I would not expect it to pass as such just because to be honest I don't think it's it's feasible, and even speaking with, with, the, um, with the policymakers, they said they don't have the stuff in the commission to deal with this currently because it would be just too much. So I think it's a proposal, it's very ambitious, and yes, I understand the, the, the point of view and what is behind, um, because the, the point of view is really to allow the consumer to make an informed choice and also to allow the consumer to reuse and to repair and to recycle the product. Um, but then again, I think it will be very difficult to, to implement in practice. Okay, I think we have to stop here and we can conclude, conclude it with saying, why make it simple? <laughs> uh, uh, I, I just saw a question that maybe I can answer. Who is performing the impact assessment um, sent for revision? Has UBP been consulted? Um, yes, so the, the impact assessment is done by a consultancy called Unomia. They're based in the UK and we have been in contact with Unomia um, quite on several occasions. So we have been consulted by Unomia. Okay, we will save the rest of the questions and maybe you can answer them later by mail or whatever because we don't have time to... to okay, sorry. ...to, to, to get, take any more. That would be a pity for Dirk then because he's the next speaker. Thank you very much, Maria. Excellent Thank you. presentation. Uh, welcome, Dirk. Uh, let me tell you, tell the, the viewers first that uh, Dirk comes from the Belgian uh, Biopack organization. He's the head of it. And uh, as Nordic Bioplastic, they belong to the Bonn Network, Bioplastics Organization Network, that is working sort of uh, under the umbrella of European Bioplastics. So uh, uh, Dirk is, has been kind enough to try to cover what's going on in the different countries. And I think he will explain a little bit more when I give you the word. So please, Dirk. Uh, share your screen and uh, the word is yours. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thanks for uh, being present this afternoon and showing your interest to what the member states of um, uh, Europe Bonn um, are doing in uh, this field. I'm um, the spokesman of uh, the Bonn Association, and uh, Bonn stands for Bioplastics Organization organization network Europe 
and it is a collaboration of uh, national uh, bioplastic organizations from across of Europe. Initially, it started in 2005 under the name of um, CBON, but in the meantime, it was relaunched in 2015 under the current name of BON Europe, and we consist of nine uh, local national associations. Still, please let me know when you want to share. Yeah, you can go to the, the next slide, please. Of uh, course. So, in at the right hand, you can see logos of the different uh, associations, and uh, the the members of Bonn are the national organizations representing um, in their um, home countries, um, like uh, converters, producers using bioplastics or bio-based uh, materials or both, as well upstream and downstream sectors, such as, uh, for instance, agriculture and waste management. The networks offers to the, the different members a kind of um, platform, a forum, to exchange information and to join efforts in uh, pushing uh, for a favorable economical and political landscape for bioplastics across of Europe. Next, please. Hello? Yep, thank you. So uh, the extent and ways in uh, which bioplastics are uh, considered and supported through um, regulatory uh, frameworks and policy uh, measures uh, across the uh, 27 member states, the UK and Norway, uh, they vary considerably. While um, the European Union is uh, currently coming or trying to come to terms with how to implement policy frameworks and strategies to best support the contributions of bioplastics towards um, achieving the ambitious climate targets they put it themselves, some individual member states are setting the pace and best cases on how to make their sure that uh, bioplastics can unfold their full potential, while other uh, members still have a more hesitant, uh, let's say, attitude towards innovation and development in this sector. Next slide, please. So as mentioned, um, the EU has set uh, a very ambitious goal to make Europe climate neutral by 2050. Uh, many of the 27 member states have set um, or adopted a similar strategy, all while acknowledging that uh, in order to achieve uh, climate neutrality, the overwhelming dependency on fossil re based resources needs to be um, replaced by alternative uh, sustainable feedstocks, such as bio-based renewable resources. Bio-based plastics or um, bio-based plastics that uh, capture uh, CO2 from the atmosphere and durably store it in products without harming uh, ecosystems are without any doubt one of the better solutions. So Italy, for instance, um, in 2017 um, voted the bioeconomy strategy uh, which was uh, already updated in 2019 with the purpose that um, interconnect more efficiently the pillars of the national bioeconomy. The production of renewable biological resources, their conversion into valuable food or feed um, bio-based products and of course um, bioenergy transformating and valorization bio-waste streams. But BIT2 aims to improve coordination between ministries and Italian regions, more in alignment of policies, regulations, and funding programs, with the goal to increase the turnover with 15% by 2030. In um, Germany, uh, the German National Research Strategy um, Bioeconomy for 2030 
and the national strategy on bioeconomy um, towards a uh, transitional bio-based economy support the industrial use of renewable resources. However, Germany is uh, reluctant to uh, promote markets uh, for bio-based plastics, both the German uh, Environmental Protection Agency and a number of environmental NGOs maintain that um, environmental benefits of bio-based plastics vis-a-vis -vis conventional plastics cannot be demonstrated consecutively by lack of uh, compatibility with existing recycling schemes. In Holland, the Dutch government um, has a very wide program for a circular economy um, aiming to achieve a fully circle, a circular economy um, in uh, the Netherlands by 2050 and to half the primary use of non-organic raw materials by 2030, which is very ambitious. Um, but while the government is quite supportive on bioplastics um, as an alternative for uh, the uh, circular plastic economy, they establish at the same time policies banning biodegradable products, such as packaging from bio-waste collection and recycling. So the focus in, in Holland is mainly based on recycling. Um, in the UK, the uh, bioeconomy strategy uh, has uh, ambitious targets for the reusability of plastics, recyclability of plastics, or the compostability by 2025. 20, However, in 2020, the uh, RAP UK Plastic Pact, uh, with support of the government, published guidance on the use of compostable packaging and recommends the use all by it in limited applications, like for uh, food uh, service where um, tea bags or coffee bags, coffee pots, and some uh, sticky labels. May I have the next slide, please? <clears throat> um, regarding the plastic tax, uh, on um, plastics, conventional plastics, in order to promote uh, bioplastics, we see that Italy um, initially uh, introduced the plastic tax already in 2020 in the budget um, law, but that was excluding compostable bioplastics certified in accordance with the EN 13432. Uh, in the meantime, uh, the um, entrance of uh, the new revised plastic tax will come into force as from January 1st on 2023. In Germany, um, according to the German packaging law, the Verpackungsgesetz, uh, um, the systems collecting the waste fees are obliged to um, create incentives to encourage uh, the use of recycled materials for material from renewable resources for the production of packaging. Despite this obligation, the system are reluctant to implement it, which is very strange as well. In Spain, the plastic tax um, for non-reusable plastic packaging uh, will enter into force by 2023 as well, applying to all types of packaging uh, to be paid by the manufacturers and the importers, exceptions uh, are as made for exports, recycling, recycled, pardon, recycled plastics, and imports of less than five kilos per month. Compostable plastics and bioplastics are not exempted. May I have the next slide? Now, um, in order to um, show you the difference in approach, we opted uh, to show you uh, two uh, cases uh, how to approach the um, extended producer uh, responsibility. In Italy, the bio repack is the first uh, EPR scheme in uh, the EU for biodegradable and compostable packaging compliant with the EN 13432 standard that aims to collect and recycle biodegradable and compostable packaging together with bio waste. BioRepack handles the end of life 
of biodegradable and compostable packaging and of those packaging with additional features of renewability, so bio-based. As long as the latter always meets the essential requirement of compostability. Based on the contribution mechanism, uh, BioRepay rewards to the municipalities the cost related to the collection, the transport and delivery of the bioplastics to the composting facility. The collection costs are rewarded in relation to the quality of the organic collected waste. Now, on the other hand, we have the UK system where uh, the revision of the uh, EPR a scheme uh, for packaging proposed to categorize compostable plastics as non-recyclable. And that because they say due to lack of sufficient recycling structure. So as a consequence, DIFRA has announced that a compostable packaging should not be collected separately or b that the epr cost of compostable packaging will therefore be at the highest rate because the materials will be deemed unrecyclable and this of course could cause risk to exclude the material from the market which is a real danger next slide Now, in generally um, speaking, is with regard to um, bioplastics and the treatment of organic waste, Italy one of the better students of the class. It serves as a very good uh, example showing um, what significant contributions bioplastics can make in the right political framework um, if that is in place. In particular, uh, bioplastics um, has been recognized by the Italian bioeconomy strategy as a strategic sector in which um, Italy um, has gained an advantage position in Europe, creating at the same time um, new jumps along the whole value chain. So the bioplastic sector has been largely promoted through the Italian legislation regulating plastic carrier bags, which requires non-reusable shoppers to be compostable according to EN 13432. The green public procurement represents another important instrument to support bio-based materials in Italy. Now, some of these initiatives have already been taken both at the uh, national level and at regional, more local level, such as, uh, for instance, uh, is the case um, in Milan, which is a very um, famous uh, city case, how to use compostable uh, bags and organize the collection of organic waste in general. With that, Italy uh, has also started to uh, provide some incentives for the production of uh, bio-based feedstock for the chemical industry, ensuring that these uh, do not compete with food crops and with particular attention to regeneration of marginalized lands. So um, this is a very uh, essential thing um, in, in order to avoid discussions uh, for using crops for making bioplastics. The government strategic plan um, for innovation and research in um, agriculture, food and forestry uh, includes also a dedicated agenda for supporting biomass for bio-based material production. Bioplastics in general represent a fast growing part of Italy's bio-based production and the bio-based and compostable bags, including the carrier bags and bags for bio-waste collection, represent the bulk of national production alongside um, other applications for agriculture, catering and food packaging. So as you see that there is a lot of things moving in Italy, uh, which can be exemplary for um, other countries. Uh, slide, next slide, please. 
Here we have a short overview of um, national initiatives and, and policies regarding to these uh, plastic uh, bags, um, starting with, um, with Belgium. Um, so at the federal level, uh, plastic bags have been banned since uh, 2005, but um, uh, Belgium has a very complicated um, structure, um, but so that the federal state made this obligation, whereas the regional states, Wallonia and Brussels, continue to allow them until March uh, 2020. Actually, um, no exemptions are, are made anymore for compostable bags. And similarly uh, to other countries, <clears throat> um, most of retail companies in Belgium switched from uh, plastic bags to uh, paper bags, either coated or laminated or reusable bigger bags. As for uh, France, uh, Single-use uh, plastic bags are forbidden in general at cash registers since 2017 and plastic bags are used other than <clears throat> for including fruit and vegetable bags that are um, below a thickness of 50 microns. They will have a home compostable in future and should have a bio-based content of at least 30%. In um, Austria, the uh, Austrian uh, plastic Sackverbot uh, bans uh, all plastic bags uh, as from 2020 on, except the reusable bags and the very lightweight, less than 15, 15 microns, uh, that are biodegradable and 90% uh, um, should degrade in 12 months between a temp. Um, yes, in temperatures between 20 and 30 degrees and contain a minimum of 50% of bio-based content. In Spain, um, initially, uh, Spain introduced a charge for all plastic bags in 2020, with ex exception of um, ultra-lightweight uh, bags used for um, primary packaging or, um, of fo loose food products and tigger bags with a recycled content of at least 70%. But since uh, 2021, uh, lightweight and ultra lightweight bags are banned as well, with the exception of a uh, compostable bag in order to coincide with the full implementation of segregated collections of organic fractions of solid uh, munici municipal weight, similar to what happened in um, Italy. Um, the next slide, please. <clears throat> now, um, for this regulation um, of putting a claim of uh, biodegradability on packaging, uh, Belgium was the first in Europe to uh, prohibit this kind of um, mentioning on uh, packaging by royal decree already in September 2008. So um, it um, prohibited to put biodegradable or oxodegradable on packaging in order to, uh, um, to uh, avoid uh, what we could call like justified littering uh, using um, this term and th that the claims compostable and home compostable can only be mentioned when they uh, fully comply uh, with all the cri criteria and bury the logos with identification of the seller or packer of that product. France uh, also um, copied uh, this um, claim of biodegradability uh, a few years later um, and it was uh, subject to uh, the new French uh, home composting standard NFT 51800. Next slide. Uh, restrictions on the single-use plastics, uh, although Maria already uh, touched a word on that, um, uh, I think we, we have to remark that um, national implementation of the single-use plastic directive uh, keeps uh, being very unharmonized and is expected that um, there will be a revision by 2027 um, in order to comply with all the comments coming up now. It um, must also be pointed out that the single-use plastics uh, directive um, 
is putting compostable plastics, as Amelia said, at the same level as uh, conventional plastics, which is, um, as a matter of fact, strongly in, in contradiction with other um, uh, European initiatives promoting and financing initiatives uh, on, on bio, bioplastics and bio-based uh, plastics. And uh, yeah, I think that the single-use um, plastic directive is also a kind of throwback in time given the fact that um, some event organizers or outdoor um, users of uh, single-use objects are no longer prepared to pay a, um, for a bio-coated cup with, for instance, PLA, um, and are e explicitly asking now for um, um, old method PE-coated um, materials. So as you can see in the slide, most of the countries have applied the SOPD one-on-one -on -one in their uh, national um, legislation, except for Italy, of course, who made an exception for uh, bio-based uh, products, and Serbia, who is going to try to copy um, this uh, Italian initiative as well. Now, um, may I have the last uh, slide, please? Um, this is about recycling of uh, compostable plastics, and I'm happy that uh, the word recycling is put in the title, um, because uh, composting is little known as one of the kind types of uh, recycling. Besides the mechanical and uh, chemical recycling, uh, composting is uh, one of the three types uh, and contributes as well to con uh, circularity. Uh, especially with regard to uh, young carbon. Now, in Belgium, the actual situation uh, with regarding to um, compostable uh, products is that uh, in uh, some um, uh, Flemish um, municipalities, the use of um, compostable uh, bio-waste bags are accepted in the collection of um, organic waste. Uh, whereas in uh, Wallonia, um, they are not. On the other hand, in Wallonia, they accept um, coffee pads and tea bags in the organic waste, whereas in Flanders, they do not. So now, as an association, we are having discussion with the um, composting industry uh, to try to harmonize the system and to get the compost um, or the organic waste stream open for uh, compostable bio-waste bags, and also uh, to harmonize the uh, initiative of making, uh, for instance, fruit labels uh, home compostable and, pack and take packaging that collects uh, and contains valuable uh, products like uh, tea and coffee to allow them as well in um, the green bin. Um, I'm hopefully not running out of time, otherwise you have to stop me, but otherwise I still want to take Netherlands as uh, the last example. In 2005-2006, uh, um, the Netherlands accepted uh, the EN 13432 uh, certified packaging, um, but since then the attitude has changed. Uh, the composting industry mostly accepts the bags, whereas uh, the treatment and accept they made depending on the acceptance and recycling the fractions. So there is a kind of contradiction into um, what was before and what happens now. I think that um, given all this, we, we can conclude that um, despite all the um, different initiatives Europe is taking, um, that there is, as a matter of fact, some, some, some lack of coherence and, and structure in the initiatives and on the other hand, on the harmonization of the um, different um, national um, initiatives taken uh, by the bond members. And that's the reason why this um, association is so important that we can talk with each other and coordinate our actions more and more in order to come to one single unique um, idea. Thank you very much. Thank you yourself, Dirk. It was very interesting and good work to, to try to cover 
all the member states. I know it's not easy, but you did an excellent job. And there are some questions for you. I don't, please, yeah, yeah, put on the camera. That's good. Um, there is a question for you, uh, and I am not sure if you can answer them because since you are an expert in Belgium, I think you can answer everything from there. But we will try. Uh, let's try. Um, with the current trend toward recycling content and recycling sector, when will we see a push from compostable materials in the EU? What is the bottleneck here? Material development, waste management, etc. And 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 uh, Marie, you might have some answers also. So um, you can answer both of you if if you have something to say. Let's start with you, Dirk. Uh, yes, I'm just looking. Uh, I'm searching for that question because I didn't get it completely. With the current trend toward recycled content and recycling sector, when will we see a push from compostable materials in EU? What is the bottleneck here? Is it material development, waste management, for example? It's, um, it's a combination of, of factors, I think. Um, there is, on the one hand, um, there is the waste management, um, and as Maria explained, um, also in, in, in uh, revisions uh, nowadays, more and more is focused on, on recycling, uh, whereas, as I said, composting is um, many times forgotten as one of the three uh, possible recycling items. And with regard to recycling and recycled content, the advantage of bi biomaterial, also already mentioned by Maria, is that we have a unique method to, to identify the recycled contact by C14 method. Whereas conventional plastics, they cannot certify which part has been uh, recycled and which part will has, is still virgin material. Once they are mixed together, they cannot be separated anymore. So um, this is one, one thing. Um, on the other hand, um, there is a, a kind of reluctancy also in, in, um, in retail um, because we have a very nice story to tell, but when it comes to end of life, uh, in most of the countries, we, we are blocked. The, 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 the packaging or the, the bio-based products, even certified compostable, are not allowed into the organic waste stream. Uh, by, um, I, I, I think they are mainly afraid of, of contamination especially in Belgium, is that one of the, the, the main issues to not allow it into, into the, 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 the organic stream. Um, we, we have a very good quality of, of, of compost. And of course, if, if, if you start allowing um, less known or unknown products into it, the risk of contamination is increasing, of course. And that's not what they want to avoid. Okay. Maria, do you have anything to add or to this? Um, I, I think Dirk uh, highlighted very well the issues. And indeed, um, there are some fears about contamination. However, one statement and one position that we have as European Bioplastic is that if the problems that are being uh, you know, considered with regards to compostable are with contamination, contamination doesn't happen only with bioplastics, it happens with all polymers. So that's something that we have to understand and that's why we need to have separate waste collection and to have properly designated uh, waste collection streams. Uh, and indeed also, like Derek mentioned, we have to see compostable as being uh, recyclable. And, and again, here it's where communication should, should take place, maybe better communication um, and maybe more us being proactively explaining and having, I don't know, doing a tour of a composting facility uh, to the EU officials to show how this happens. Uh, because I think seeing, you know, with their own eyes, how does that work? It would be very helpful. Yeah. You know, here in Sweden, we don't have any, any industrial composting at all. So... We are sort of limited there. <laughs> That's a problem. Um, yeah, may, maybe both of you can answer this also. Very short question. Has or will EN 13432 be revised? It's 22 years now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is under revision now. Okay. It is under revision. Um, um, as what I understood from uh, some of our uh, members of the Belgian uh, Biopackaging Association is that um, it is not 
very clear now uh, whether um, home composting should be part of the general composting um, directive. And second, uh, what distinction has to be made between conventional composting and anaerobic digestion? Uh, because also there is um, an issue uh, as more and more um, composting plants are moving towards anaerobic digestion in order to gain the gas and then put afterwards the digestate, preferably with a post-composting uh, process, onto the land as a kind of uh, carbon sink. But maybe Maria um, knows a little bit more about this um, EN 13432 revision. Unfortunately, I don't more than you do, so I don't have anything else to add to that. All right. I think we, we, we can call it a day then because we have passed the time with like seven minutes. That's no problem in a way, but uh, I think we have said one hour and that's there we are now. And I, I would like to thank you both for excellent presentations. And I hope that uh, all your viewers have get a little bit of enlightenment and understand more about this. And I also get the question again about uh, the presentations and everything. And as I said before, the presentations will be uploaded uh, uh, if the presenters don't have anything against it, which I doubt, will be uploaded on, on our webpage, the Nordic Bioplastics Organization's webpage. But it will take you know, a, a week or two maybe. And also all this has been recorded so you can listen to it again. And it will also be placed there. So. I would like to take the opportunity to wish you all a very nice summer uh, holidays. We all earn it, I think. And also um, like to tell you that we will be back, of course. We will continue uh, in the fall with um, uh, webinars every six weeks. And uh, we actually do need some help from you viewers about uh, coming up with ideas that we could cover uh, because we have a lot of brainstorming uh, in, in the board of Nordic Bioplastics uh, um, uh, every month about what will be the next topic. We just find out something, but it would be nice to hear from you. What would you like to listen to? And that would make it a little bit easier for us. So thank you very much for listening this time. And thank you, Maria, and thank you, Dirk. Uh, hope to see you soon. You. As I said, if not before, so in Berlin for the European Bioplastics Congress yes, sure. in December. And thank you everyone for listening and bye-bye.